Okay. Okay. You good? Yep. Okay, me too. Okay. Hi, everybody. Um, we're going to see if how well this works technologically. Casey, who's Casey Fellerfin, who's my collaborator, who's also Dr. Casey Fellerfin, is in St. Louis. Um, so she's going to be with us by Skype. I'm here, as you can see. But I've got her T-shirt on, which is the only bio biologist I know who has like rock star T-shirts. And on the back it says, listen, which is quite nice. Um, in any case, thanks for coming. Thanks a lot to Claire for hosting us for this last month. Thanks a lot to Dana for making the beautiful lights happen and a whole lot of the AV happen. Um, this is, it's the second project Casey and I have done. We started in 2014. We met at Bio, uh, Mountain Lake Biological Station in Pembroke, Virginia, which, and can you guys hear me okay? Am I right? Yeah, David says good, okay. Um, we were both, so Mountain Lake Biological Station is a beautiful space owned by University of Virginia that's close to Virginia Tech in Pembroke, Virginia, up the mountain. And that was the second year that um, they had started what's called Art Lab. So all year round, the space is used by biologists. In the summer, it's basically like summer camp for, bio, for biology students and biologists. And for two weeks, artists are on the grounds and doing projects and meeting other people across disciplines, um, sort of with the hopes of you know, knowledge, collaboration, friendships, whatever might come. And each year, there's a group of artists, and one person is sort of the featured and person. And that year, I was the featured artist. I gave a talk, and I was talking about my history of sound installations. <coughs> Sorry, I'm not crying. I'm like, moment of, um, of um, throat. But in any case, sound installations, listening through surface vibration. And two nights later, Casey gave her talk as a featured biologist about listening to certain insects, recording, um, eavesdropping through surface vibration, putting basically scientific, um, very similar to contact mics, um, accelerometers, to the surface of plants and leaves and branches, and hearing insects through that you could only hear through surface vibration. And it was, you know, it was one of those moments where you sort of feel like, ooh, this is a conversation. And I'm usually like too nervous to go up afterwards, but I thought, this is a person I could talk to, and maybe we have things in common. And just in terms of the talk I had given, and for a few friends and family who are here, maybe have heard this story too much, so I'm sorry, but um, about 12 years ago, I was in Australia doing a project. I had done recordings in the outback, um, and I was doing a public art commission in Sydney, and came and met with this group of school children. I was in a bad mood. It was like. The day before the, sh the show opened, I was tired. I'd done more press and more installation and more everything, and I just didn't want to talk to more people. And I met these kids, and I talked a little bit about my work, and I said, I've been out, I've been recording, and OK, let's go in and take a listen. And they were just like, everybody had questions. And they were you know, so much better questions than anyone else, any of the press or any of the sound art students have been asking me. <laughs> and. Um, I sort of realized my stupid bias and I should get over myself and that it was actually pretty exciting to talk to them. But this one girl who's here with her eyes closed pulled me aside and said, can I ask you a question? And I said, sure. And she said, do you ever just put your ear to the table when your teacher is talking and just listen to the, the vibrations? And I got like teary eyed and you know, I was probably 40 years old at that point. So the idea that my teacher talking was just a beautiful idea, but also the fact that she wanted to like, reveal the secret and that she listened really weirdly <laughs> and in a wonderful way that she just listened, you know, that, that sort of just vibration of voices was, was interesting to her. And for me, let's see if this works. My, you know, sort of flip from, I grew up playing in bands, playing music, and really the, the moment that I, I stopped probably being a musician and a musician who made sound for other people is when I did the World Trade Center residency. And the only way that I could 
get sound through the windows of the 91st floor studio. The windows didn't open, you could hear nothing. The only way was when I finally learned about contact mics and putting contact mics on the window, hearing the city through the surface vibration of the windows. And you know, these were like cheap little $20 um, contact mics sold in a drum shop in New York, but now I've realized you, know, you can make them, you can buy more expensive ones, but it was really just, it was reading the world outside through the vibration of the windows, which was not unlike the way you'll hear Casey speak about her work in a moment, except that she's using much fancier devices, recording much, 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 much quieter sounds. Um, this was my studio in the World Trade Center where I had usually two mics on the window, speakers, headphones, and nothing else. And um, I started to use contact mics for different things. I put them on Donald Judd sculptures in Marfa, Texas, when people told me you can do anything around the Judds, um, but you can't touch them. So I contact mic'd microphones to the Donald Judd speakers and tried to listen to the history of minimalism and did. <laughs> I did hear like popping, creaking, and cracking because it was hot summer, um, Texas, and went outside. This is also in Marfa. Uh, but cut to now back to 2014, me started to work with Casey, um, talked about collaboration. This was a contact mic on a stem of a, um, a flower, and just, and she, She'll talk, again, she'll talk about her work, but one of the things that she was studying when I met her um, was Daddy Long Legs, or, or um, what do you call him, Casey? Har Daddy Har Long Legs. But, Har <laughs> Har but Harvestman, right? Yes, anyway, Harvestman yeah, as well. Okay. Um, so we ended up doing, a, you know, I feel like with collaboration, you sort of shift the balance sometimes. There's never 100% equal, but I had been asked um, by Margot Crutchfield at Virginia Tech to do an installation or a project for their cube space, which is a 144 channel sound system. Um, and my thought was, that's very close to Mountain Lake Biological Station. I'm just starting to work with Casey. I'd love to do more. What if we ask them for funds to do that? And um, so they funded our return. Uh, and the following year, Oh, this is what it looks like. That was supposed to be my first slide. Um, the following year, we did this installation at Virginia Tech in the Cube. And with that project, it was called The Scuttering Across the Leaves. It was all the recordings that Casey and I did together, but very much, I guess, then weighted towards, at that point, being like me in collaboration with Casey in that I composed for this space. It's five stories high. Like you see here, we have six channels, six discrete channels. There we had 144. Um, and some of the sounds were mixed based on morning, some were evening, but there wasn't a real science behind it except that I was using the sounds. And maybe just this idea that suddenly the way that they are like so tiny little insects and we become big in this installation, we were actually quite small compared to the scale of the sounds and the scale of the space. But with the project we're gonna talk about that we're, that's here, I feel like it's kind of been reversed. And now a few years later, Casey got this NSF grant. Uh, she has a specific research and specific uh, thesis that she's working through. And so, you know, there's a sound piece, if some of you have been in the show and visited the show already, maybe you know this, but there's a sound piece here and there's some didactic info back there but the sound piece I really constructed to, in some ways, amplify, I don't wanna say illustrate, because I think that's a terrible, like it makes it overly obvious, but working with this idea of her, her research, taking insects recorded at cold temperatures, warming up, warm, hot, um, between specific um, parameters of Celsius um, readings and composed within those frameworks, these sort of sound worlds at cold, at warm, at warming up, at, or warming up and warm that hot. Um, and I'll talk about that more, but I think the next thing I wanna do is jump to Casey. She's gonna talk about her research 
this project, and then I'll talk a little bit more about composing this piece, and then we'll just talk a little bit about collaboration. Okay, so, and, okay, you're on. You're going. Okay. Do you mind turning the video on? I'm going to do it. Um, yep, perfect. All right, hello, everyone. Um, I would have loved to have been there, but I have a four-month-old at home that makes it a little bit hard to travel, but I'm very thankful to Sediment for rigging it up so that I can Skype in with you guys. Um, first of all, like Stephen said, this project was uh, a product of an NSF grant that's currently funding work in my lab, and so part of the grant money actually went towards working with Stephen on a way to communicate what we're researching to uh, people who might not normally encounter it slide. So if I were there, I would ask the audience what, what they think sound is. And I typically get a range of answers. But if you go to the next slide, Stephen, if you do a Google of different definitions of sound, this is what you see. So you see waves, propagate, medium, air, vibrations. If you go to the next slide, what the main definition is, is Sound is vibrations that travel through air or other media. So when we typically think of sound, if you go to the next slide, we think of humans talking, the sounds traveling through the air, it's hitting our ears. You can go ahead and click. Hi, how are you? So that's what we, we think of. If you go to the next slide, sound also travels through water and you can play that one as well. So that's a whale. It even travels through the ground. So if you skip ahead to the elephant and play that sound. And then you so those are sounds that elephants make that travel through both the air and the ground. And when they travel through the ground, the elephants can pick it up in their trunks and in their feet. Sound can also travel on the surface of water. So if you play the little video of those water striders, you can see the ripples across the water surface. You even have airborne sound that gets picked up by things like spider webs, and that's how spiders orient to their prey. But what we'll be talking about today and what you're hearing in the installation is actually sound that travels through plant matter like stems and leaves. And this is what we call vibrational communication. And vibrational communication occurs in insects as the primary way that insects communicate with one another. So when you go out into the summer night and you hear crickets and katydids and cicadas, that's actually less than 10% of what insects are singing to one another. The other 90 some percent you can't hear with the naked ear, but you have to tap into plant stems and leaves with special equipment that Stephen was discussing in order to hear those sounds. So I'm gonna try to play one actually out loud. Can you still hear me? We can hear you. You can also imitate them, you do that well. I usually save that as a last ditch effort, which I might have to do because my PowerPoint is also crashing. Um, so insects will sing to one another and the types of things you hear with insects that I study is ooh, mmm, ooh, mmm. These might like what males do, but what they are is the male saying ooh, like here I am, and the female goes mmm -hmm, if she likes him. And that's how insects find one another to mate. So since my PowerPoint's totally crashing, I'm going to wing this from here. It actually turns out that most animals use substrate-borne vibrations. So when we think about communication in insects, one thing that my lab studies is how environmental disturbance affects that communication. So I mentioned that these insects are singing to one another in order to attract and find mates. And if the environment changes and changes the song that's created, 
that might make it very difficult for insects to find one another. So I liken this to um, if you sing like a mouse at one temperature and a cat at another, how does another cat find you? Um, so what this installation is based on is this idea that with global warming, we may have profound effects on insect communication. And in particular, temperature alters how signals are produced by insects. So when you go through the installation, what you can hear are changes in the pitch of the signals, so the frequency, you hear lower sounds at lower temperatures and higher sounds at hotter temperatures. The other thing that you hear in the installation is the rates of signaling change. So you hear kind of slow signaling um, patterns at low temperatures and faster at, at hotter temperatures. And then the last thing that you find is that the likelihood that they're gonna communicate with one another changes with temperature. So you might hear different insects at different temperatures. And what we've been finding in my lab is that when you look at the pitch of these signals, the males sing very differently at lower versus hotter temperatures. So at a lower temperature, males sing like this. Ooh, ooh, ooh. And at hotter temperatures, they go, ooh, 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 ooh. It turns out that females actually can track this change very well. So at low temperatures, they prefer these lower pitch signals. And at hot temperatures, they actually prefer males to sing with the higher signals. So that's actually one really good um, thing, one good lesson to take away from the research is that it seems like at least the songs they produce are not going to affect whether or not insects can find one another to mate if climate change continues to warm up our planet. So what I think actually might be kind of the determining factor if insect populations will still be able to reproduce as the climate changes is this fact that they alter how likely they are to signal at different temperatures. So you could imagine if insects are really excited about signaling at say 25 degrees and the temperatures change to an average of 30, these insects are no longer gonna be very reproductively active. And so that might lead to reduced mating rates and that might threaten insect populations. And what we're also finding is that some species prefer lower temperatures and some species prefer hotter temperatures. So we actually might find that some species are better at adapting to climate change than others. And with that, I'm gonna throw it back to you, Stephen. So with the recordings, as we mentioned, there's, it's about a nine minute and 20, nine, nine, I think nine minute and 20 second composition first minute and 45 seconds or so um, at the coldest temperatures moving through. We thought about, and I can't even remember, honestly, I feel like each one of us separately and together has had some of these same ideas, but there was a thought about how do you cue people into what they're hearing and what the conditions were. And I've used light in a number of my installations. Um, in any case, Dana came rigged a very nice lighting system and did a lighting design. We set four different colors, blue for the coldest, then yellow, then orange, then red. So each section, basically the way that you know what temperature it is, is just you're cued in by the, the color of the lights. And in the back of the gallery, there's a, uh, a designed graphic that has that as a kind of score, um, score for the structure. But it's, it's tricky. I mean, I say this probably in every artist talk I've ever given, but if, if I make pieces that are too visual, then people think the visuals are dominant and the sound is in support of the image. We just were conditioned to think that sound is less important than picture so often. And so the idea is that it's just a little, it's just a cue. It just gives you enough information, but you're not like staring at the blue light and feeling that, oh, I am, 
sorry Dana, but you know, bathed in the most beautiful blue light of all time. It's just, it's just letting you know here is where we are and then it shifts. And you know, the other thing is, is if you're not following the science, ideally that's totally okay too and you're just listening to sounds that you've probably never heard before. And this is, I mean, this is one of the magic of recording and working with Casey is that we'll be out in the field, we'll be reaching in, well, she'll be reaching into thorny bushes, putting the accelerometer onto the stem of a flower or a plant, and she'll say, I don't know what that is, and we may be the first people to ever hear that sound ever. And that's, that's, there's a thrill of that that there's no way to reproduce in art or playback, but what I've tried to do with, you know, with, with composing those sounds is just put you in a little bit of a version of the sound world. I mean, we're lucky if we're sitting out there for an hour and we hear a couple things. So I'm also taking liberty with, you know, time and space and layering. But I have, you know, I just, I pulled some of the files. We're recording with beautiful scientific instruments going through film quality um, cinema style preamp from the 70s or, um, into a professional audio recorder, but it's still so quiet that there's a lot of line noise. And you know, so I, I'll come back from a trip with 20, 30 hours of sounds and I'll be listening for things, but I'll also even also looking at the image to see if I can see things that might even be outside the range of hearing or in an hour of you know, trying to figure out what's wind, what might be a little rhythm of an insect that even needs further and further and further amplification. And this was just like a really nice moment, if I can get it to play. I still remember when we, that ooh, we both looked at each other, it was, wow! And I know for the rest of the world, that's just like, huh? But that first sound, that very mechanical sound, is it, is, is it an oak tree hopper, or what is that first one? Do you know, Casey? Um, that, yeah, Sorry. black locust. It's a black locust? It might be a black locust tree hopper, but I'm not sure. Okay. Um, there's times we can't, you know, because we can't even see the insects or she'll be clearing the way, trying to figure out is that little, is it that little, you know, black beetle-like looking one with the red stripe, what is it? Some of them are calls that she probably knows from the lab, but others, you know, are, are still mysterious. Sometimes we hear a call and response. Uh, I didn't do this in any structured way, but like, I think that has a little bit of noise reduction. I, I'll go through different levels of noise reduction, but part of the problem is to sort of retain sort of, you know, all the qualities you want. And part of the truth of this version of the installation is that, so when we did this at Virginia Tech, we just had all the substrate borne vibrations, just the recordings from the accelerometers. And, um, but in this space, what I've done is I've used an, uh, a sound field microphone that has four capsules and records spherically and recorded the environment. So you hear the place at the temperature with birds, with cicadas, with other you know, insects you would hear from your ears. And I sort of have them way on the periphery. And then I have the accelerometer recordings, the insect recordings that will be more pinpointed to a speaker and then slowly usually revolving but one of the nice things about the outdoor recordings is that all the just natural sound of wind and the cicadas and all of that masks some of, you know, so all of that hiss that you're hearing is actually sort of buried in the natural environment. Um, but I, I thought just even bringing it up in this program was interesting because, you know, I mean, I don't know how well you guys can see the screen, but uh, seeing the spectrogram, you can, see, like, you can see stuff is happening in here and so I'll go to, you know, this is probably an edit from a much longer recording, but I'll go in. And you can see something is happening. So, 
And so even as I clean it up and take away more and more noise, I'll, I'll be sort of both listening and looking. Um, all right. So the thing, I mean, maybe what we might just a little bit talk about more about collaboration and then we'll st and see if there's a question and answer. I'll get her back up on the screen. Uh, but I, I will say, I mean, it's, it's, we've been working together since 2014 and I feel incredibly fortunate and I feel, you know, I, I collaborate a lot. Um, I doubt, I mean, Casey runs her lab, which is a kind of collaboration, but it's probably not the same kind of thought process as working as artists do. But it's, it's a collaboration I deeply value. I feel like I've learned so much. And something that makes, I think, made us both unbelievably proud was um, at, when the show opened at Virginia Tech, uh, there was different talks that were given. And Butch Brody, who runs Mountain Lake Biological Station, uh, who's a professor at UVA, gave a talk. And he said, you know, there was, there was some resistance from the biologists when we opened up Art Lab because it was sort of like, well, you know, suddenly there's going to be artists and they're going to be on the grounds. And, and I can't remember if he said this in the talk but, or if he just, I heard this privately, but, you know, the thought was artists have a lot to gain from the scientists. What are the scientists going to get from exposure to the artists? And when we presented our collaboration, he said this was the first time he was convinced that there could be this mutual exchange. And it just, it gave me a little prickles of joy and, and, and felt proud that we just, because I did feel like we had sort of taught each other and we've tried to keep in communication in a way that, that you know, we're both learning and we're both doing something we wouldn't do without the other. Do you want to say anything on that line or totally disagree? I, I mean, I completely agree. Um, I think part of what I love about the collaboration is hearing the sounds through your ears and uh, I think the bugs speak to me in a different way because of that. And then also just going out into the field and listening. I think if there are any scientists there, you might appreciate the fact that it's hard to get just like a week to go out and listen and see what you see. And this collaboration not only produces something really wonderful in the end, but also gives me that opportunity to just sit and observe and see things that I would not see otherwise. So we'll see how easy it is to do with you there and us here, but let me see if people have any questions. Um, hi. See, do the insects generate the sounds vocally or are they moving some other body part to create the vibration that's transmitted? Could you hear the question? That's a great question. Yeah, how do they produce the sounds? Yeah. Yeah, unfortunately that was part of my PowerPoint, but I'll just, there are several ways that they can produce sound. Some are they're just hitting body parts against the substrate. In others, they're using tremulation, which is basically moving back and forth different body parts. In other cases, they're using stridulation. So they're rubbing two body parts together. And then in other, cases are using timbal mechanisms, which are again, another sort of muscle vibration that's sort of amplified within the body. And it travels through the legs and into the plant stem. Yeah, I'm, I, the, sad, the sad thing, I just kept watching and actually trying to force quit the PowerPoint, but it would not behave. <laughs> but anyway, thanks for that. How about any, anybody else? Hey. Um, is there any uh, analog in humans for like talking more when it's hot or maybe it's colder we talk less uh will climate change like make it harder to communicate with my wife <laughs> you gotta answer that one like yeah okay um so the nice thing about humans is that we can regulate our own body temperature separately from external conditions i suppose if we if our temperatures went up, we might change how we talk somewhat. But the, the reason why insects are so profoundly influenced is that they can't regulate their body temperature externally from the air temperature. So I don't think we'll have a bunch of super chatty, high-pitched humans when it gets warmer. But That's a good idea. <laughs> hey, Do you wish you had some micro video equipment so you could get 
images of what they they look like when they're making those sounds? Was that for me? That's for you. Yeah, I think it's okay. just about it's about being able to see well what you can hear. Yeah, absolutely. We're we're trying to start cataloging that in my lab and making that kind of publicly available as we do that. So the idea is to try to figure out how different insects are making these different sounds and see if certain insects produce sounds in one way and others produce sounds in a different way. So that's kind of a long-term goal um, that we're, we're working on. Yeah, I mean, they are, and even in the pictures in the, in the back of the gallery, they're wild looking and just have very rarely, and I mean, I think this is also about your skill set, which is, you know, we'll go up to a tree or a branch and suddenly Casey will say, oh, I see them. And I'm just like, how, like there's just these little lumpy things on a, on a branch and, but, and then there will be a tree hopper. So some of this you can, you, you've learned to spot, right? I mean, based probably on what the plant is, what the temperature is, part of, you know, and then part of it also seems to be kind of like fishing and sort of just hoping you, you get the right spot at the right moment. Hey. All the way in the back. I'm, um, I'm curious uh, on your point as to when you go out in the natural environment and set up your equipment, how do you decide how to go about that? Where to place your little microphones? I, don't, I can't remember your term. Sure. Yeah. yeah. So, so how do you decide that? I mean, what I've, I'll, I'll answer first. And Casey, could you hear the question? Yes. Okay. I mean, I think part of it seems, and, and she'll, she'll speak to this better, but I think part of it is sort of, will go to a place and she'll know it's the season when they're probably starting to be, you know, sort of big enough to, um, to be active. Uh, and, you know, and like at Mountain Lake, we would go each day and then we started to see, okay, there's a time around 1030 in the mornings that seems to be kind of relatively fertile, um, sort of a grassy area that is good. Casey would have her grad, st her grad students, and then Olivia with the pink hair was there at the time, was there with me as a KI student or recently graduated, and she would send them out with little suction cup microphones and little guitar amplifiers, these little battery-powered amps, and do like scouting. So also, the three, the three of them would go out and sort of say, ha, over here by the milkweeds, and then suddenly they'd, you know, and then they'd be gone, and then we would have to wait for the, the afternoon. But do you want to say more or say it better? Um, I mean, I think you said it great. Uh, I would only add that sometimes you can hear the insects walking around, mm -hmm. or you might hear some sort of what I call contact calls, an insect sort of sending out taps to see if anyone's there. And when you hear that, that often pr precedes something more elaborate. But it takes a lot of patience. Yeah. A lot of patients. I did um, this recent year. I did a trip. Casey couldn't make it because I think baby. But um, so I went with her PhD student Will, and I found that like, it was interesting. They had very different methods. Like he would he would jump around a lot more. Casey, or no, actually it was the other way around. You would jump around a lot more. He was just more like we're just going to sit here for an hour, and I just keep thinking. But if Casey was here, she'd move it. But in, in each case, they had methods to their, you know, not madness, but intelligence and, and, and experience. And I know we got things with Will that probably Casey might have moved on too quickly. And we got things with Casey that, you know, whatever, because she kept looking for that next piece of grass. Hey, Tony. So Casey, you described the calls in terms of mating calls. But I imagine there might be others like uh, trying to scare a predator or warn another insect about predator in the region. Have you been able to distinguish different um, <laughs> rationales for the communication? Um, I didn't hear the last part of that in terms of what was the rationale part? Well, different, uh, the different types of calls. Have you been, you know, one being a mating, one being scaring someone off, another one yeah. being warning? Yeah, so there, insects use these vibrations for everything. They use it to find mates. They use it to warn predators that they're noxious. So if you look at the picture of the ebony bug, that guy does this monkey chicken call is what I've called it. And um, when they do that, they release a chemical and you can smell it. 
And so in that situation, you can infer that they're basically telling a predator, I'm nasty, stay away. Um, there are also calls that happen between moms and babies that happen in the presence of a disturbance. And so it's moms telling the babies to be quiet because there's a predator nearby, or it's babies telling moms, there's a predator over here, come save us. So they use it in a lot of different contexts, and there are some general rules at times that help you figure out what's what. Um, and a lot of that is just contextual. What's going on in the environment when you do it? Or do you know a researcher who's studied this phenomenon before? Tony. Uh, I noticed with the installation, a, a lot of the sounds of the insects also sounded very mechanical. Mm -hmm. And like they sound a lot like a lawnmower or something. Mm -hmm. um, and you said that you got maybe like 20, 30 plus hours of these recordings. So I was just mm -hmm. kind of wondering, like, because I have a hard time listening to something for like 45 minutes, but um, like, how do you how do you deal with that? Like, are you relying heavily on like the spectrogram? Like, do they have distinct spectrograms as opposed to just like maybe a car or something? I think I think part of it's part of it's looking. Part of it's I do listen through to everything, um, and then part of it. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. I mean, I think it's a combination of, of both. And oh, part of it is keeping a notebook when we're in the field. And so remembering that take 732, something really amazing happened around two minutes and 30 seconds. And usually what happens is if we're together is we'll also we'll listen, ideally we'll listen after we do the sessions. Like let's say there's the down hours when no insects are calling. So we'll meet up, um, when we were at Mountain Lake, we'll meet up in my cabin with speakers and we'll listen through because I'm going, oh, that's a cool sound. And Casey's saying, yes, but that's what, that's X. Or, oh, yeah, I get that in the lab all the time. That's actually not that special. So, you know, and so I think that's also where our, our interests combine is, is, I mean, I'm just sort of, I'm partially just looking for sonic content. But then because this is working with a scientific thought process and research, I'm also thinking, OK, well, I have an oak tree hopper in cold temperatures. I've got to find an oak tree hopper at warm temperatures to sort of work through the, the ideas of her research, but also the, for the form of the composition. But yeah, I mean, there's, there's one we've never used. I should have brought it with me, but I, mean, I could share it with some of the, the people here later. But there was um, the sheepy bug. Yeah, do you want me to try to play that? Because I think I. Okay. I can set up my microphone so I can play it. All right. Um, this was all right, so, just... so, so ridiculous that we truly thought if we used it, people would just laugh and think it was fake. So you know like those toys that you turn it upside down and it goes, Meh, you know, it's a cow or something. That's what we were hearing in the field. Yeah, Stephen refused to use it in the first piece. I'm too serious as an artist. Okay. Let me know if this works. Okay. It worked. And here's, here's one more. We didn't get that one, but. You heard the cow, though? No, but we got the first. OK. In any case, I mean, it's, it's there was that sound that we kept hearing in that first trip. And then there was also. A, there's a sound in our first piece that was one of the deepest, lowest physical sounds I've ever heard. And like, imagine turning, for those of you who are sound people, an oscillator down to the deepest, warmest tones of the most beautiful thousand-dollar oscillator that is all analog circuitry. And I think Olivia was there for this one too, and Casey and Will and Doan. And we just were, just, what the hell is that boat that's vibrating through the ground? And it was a little moth fanning itself on the edge of a, um, of a flower. And we were out in the field at night, five of us with little headlamps, headphones on, listening to this thing vibrate our whole bodies. And it, you know, couldn't figure out what the hell it was. I was sure it was mechanical. 
And then it was just a little moth just fanning itself. Okay. Um, the frequencies that you were recording right. are not transposed into the audio realm. No. For these pieces. They're just made louder. Right? Is that, I mean, because which like bat recordings where you have to bring them to an audible frequency range, these are not, these are just amplifying them. So the amplitude has increased. Right. Right. Yeah. Hey. How many species? And this is probably, I mean, for us, but probably for you, right? Because you're looking for certain ones. There were three big ones that we used, I think, as kind of the centerpieces. Um, and then there were a bunch more. I, I mean, it's hard to count. It's hard to know sometimes which insect is producing the sound. And sometimes it's the, the call. Sometimes we're just, well, it's not doing it, but it's like it's a caterpillar walking or it's a spider walking. And um, so there's all the other ones that we weren't looking for that just happened to be there. Somebody else had a question. Okay, this. Are you at all aware if your subjects are aware of you? Did you get, so are, are, are the subjects aware of us or aware of you, either one? I know Sometimes, that. absolutely. Yeah. The mom, why, the mom, why do you know that? So for example, the, the oak tree hopper moms, we would poke them and they would, so they would, <laughs> they would start calling as soon as we poked them and they would kick at us. And then there were the ebony bugs that started chirping when we got close. And then there are these ants that would sometimes attack our recording okay. equipment. They really did. They ganged up the ants and just like, so there's all these beautiful recordings of them biting the microphone. And it's a thousand dollar little thing, you know. Yeah. <laughs> but, yeah. Hey. Do you feel like, um, I don't know why I was talking about it. do you feel like when you're listening to, um, to things through the surface of the matter, that it's similar to like, being a fetus and hearing the whole world? Just, I, I guess that's like the first experience yeah. in the world. Sure, so. sure. Do you hear the question? Was sort of was, do you feel like no. there's any connection between listening to those sounds and, and listening to the, the fetus or being the fetus, being a fetus and listening out to the, the vibration of the world? Did you say being a fetus? Yeah. You got to ask your, your baby. Okay. <laughs> Sometimes I feel like that actually because you hear the world in such a different way, and when you're listening in, it makes you feel really small. Yeah. Which is, I think, what we then played with with the piece at Virginia Tech, was just being that small and, and, and having these sounds five stories high and that large. Hard to know, but it's a nice question. Maybe one, one more, two more? Uh, it sounds like so the research agenda was maybe already set from the onset. Was the composition of the piece in here, did you have that in mind when you went out? And were you like filling it in or did it emerge as you went? So, you know, when we, I think the research, you know, at least as I was exposed to it, was from going back about a year and a half or two years. So we've done recordings together where Casey wasn't testing measurements. But then, in the sense, this composition became, began with that trip from about a year and a half ago when she was then starting to gather measurements of, of temperature. Uh, and so at that point, I knew the piece would, would be re taking the, you know, sort of groups based on temperature readings. Um, and it's, you know, it's funny because with this one, there's so many beautiful sounds I have that weren't documented with temperature that I desperately wanted to use, but I was limited by, by that. And there's a few in here that came from her lab because we were just like, we have nothing good at, of this insect at this temperature, and she had others from the lab. And uh, you know, for me, as part of the collaboration, I sort of love having been part of the process. But for the work, that, you know, that doesn't matter to you guys. But, but there is something about having gathered these together 
thought through what will happen with them. But then after that, sort of Casey leaves it to me to, to work with the sounds. Maybe one more? Okay, well, mo almost like 98% of you know how to find me. And if people have questions for Casey, I'm sure I can, um, I can you know, if there's something that was like burning, hey. then ask, hey, go. Steven, I have, I have um, three insects that we used quite a bit through the piece at cold and warm temperatures. Yeah. Do you want me to try to play those so people can listen for them? Yeah, that would be nice as, a, as our parting coda. Okay. So I'm just going to go ahead and, and do it. You can hear me okay? Yeah. All right. So this is the ebony bug. And it's the bug that signals that it's noxious. And this is at a low temperature. And this is it um, four degrees warmer. Did that come through okay? It, it did, yeah. Okay, so then this is the oak tree hopper, and this is a mom basically telling her babies, you better be quiet so that a uh, predator can't hear them. So this is at about 18 degrees Celsius. Could you hear that? Yep. And this is about four degrees warmer. And then the last one um, are the tree hoppers that I study. And this is them at a warmer temperature. Cool. That's what I got for you. All right, thank you. <laughs> There was this um, a nice radio piece that we we're both in on Virginia Public Radio that said we're making music with these sounds, and I don't know if I think of it as music, but then I kept listening to Bees in the Trap, um, Nicki Minaj this morning, thinking like, this is going to be our big commercial breakthrough, is we're going to do tree hoppers in the something, I don't know what. But... Um, I don't know, S Stephen, you did one piece that we submitted um, to a radio show that I sometimes listen to when I work. I know that was good. They didn't understand how good it, it was. was. Very good. They didn't use it, which no. is sad. All right. Anyway, thank you, audience. Thank you, Casey. And thank you, everybody. <laughs>